Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. Always, we are joined by Michael, our resident ephesiologist. I am Andrew Johnson, associate pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas, and we have two incredible guests. Uh, as we teased in the previous recording, uh, we are joined by Dave Lee, who is both a former professor and friend of our other guest, Matt Till, uh, former co-host of the Ephesiology Podcast. Oh, that pres- sounds so bad, former. Well, is he still in the past the former? Uh, that's all I was saying. That's all I was saying. It's a very welcome and familiar voice. Uh, Dave, welcome <laughs> on, and Matt, welcome back. What Maybe retired is retired any better? Retired <laughs> co-host. For, for clarification: I was not a former professor. I'm a former pastor. A former pastor. Well, as a pastor now, I think I think that passes. I like that. Okay. So I'm glad I'm glad we got that all cleared up. Uh, I like to think of Dave. I like to th- I, I like to think of Dave as a true public theologian because as long as I've known Dave, wherever he is, no matter what he is doing professionally or privately, this man is a wealth of theological knowledge and inspiration to me personally, to my family, and to all those in whom he meets. So he is a true public theologian. That's neat. Do you want to put that on a business card, Dave? Man, I, I would like that on a T-shirt. There we go. <laughs> it's coming your way, Dave. Uh, well, well, with that resounding intro, Dave, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself beyond pastor and uh, extremely wonderful public theologian? <laughs> well, you know, my background was I came to Christ when I was a teenager, went to, uh, I immediately began absorbing theological material, by which I mean systematic theologies. I read through Calvin's Institutes before I got to college, um, went to a, went to a state college, got a degree in journalism, went from there to um, working with Christian organizations, became a, a student, a grad student at Wheaton, got my master's in theological studies there, and uh, from there engaged in various ministries. And throughout that journey from my 14-year-old conversion outward, I participated in house churches. I participated in um, traditional churches. I guess you guys call them legacy churches. Um, I've done interim pastor work as well as senior pastor work. And um, these days I see that as uh, just fond memories as I work in the marketplace uh, in a secular job. And uh love the light that scripture brings to everything I do, whether it's in my job, my family, or my church relationships. Mm. Man, we can love we that. duplicate you? Can we can we just have you uh lots of people imitating you and and that uh that wisdom uh and that observation of how to live life well. That is mm. that is incredible. Dave, we are so excited to have you on uh to the podcast today. Okay. Uh before I, I let the I let the thread fall, Matt, you are back with us. It is so good to have you on the podcast. Uh, how are you? Where are you? Uh, can can you give a can you give a good uh, thirty second update for the listeners who have missed hearing you? Yeah, well, it's always great to be in discussion with you guys and thanks for inviting me back um for this i had to dust off the old microphone it's been a, <laughs> it's been a hot minute um yeah our, our our family as well uh we we are doing well uh we we made a move as as you know and as your audience would know if they listened back a number of years because i think we were still recording together um we've been in the uh miami fort lauderdale area um and i've been working for a christian seminary down here but um, more importantly, one of just our kind partners, of, by the way, so you can yes, say the name. That's right. Knox Theological Seminary, a partner of uh, Ephesiology Masterclasses. So for those who 
uh, pursue a, uh, uh, a program within the master classes, you can transfer some of those credits into one of uh, the programs at the seminary uh, and finish up your master of divinity or uh, other master degree program that you might be interested in. So uh, that's exciting. Thanks, Michael, for the plug. Um, well done. Think, where's the bell? Do you guys have a bell yet? No. Oh no! You I know what? Not, I've been on I don't, Andrew to use his little no whatever those things I, are called. No, no, no! I don't bell. have the soundboard ready, right? <laughs> like the soundboard next to it. Uh, no. Uh, that'd be uh, so um, yeah, so you know th that's been it's been good. I've been working on just uh, also just uh, developing uh, communications and communication strategies, not just for them, but even just um, uh, professionally myself as well too. Um, and uh, really focusing on my uh, my family um, in this time. So um, and I've uh, been kind of working on uh, developing maybe some other side projects yet to be uh, fully announced at this point. But um, excited just to be with you guys and have this conversation. That's wonderful. Uh, at the later part of the podcast, if you do want to break any ground and announce any future side projects uh, that you have been saving for this moment to announce to the world, I would I would love it. Like that would be the, that would be the best. Because I know that's what you would do. For, wait, what is it that we ask for? We ask Exclusive, for nothing. Exclusivity. No. We have no. When you make these announcements. No, no claim. Scoop. Sure. Yeah. No oh, that. Hey, that, we can have the scoop, right? Scoop. That's a, that's, that's right. We have a at least we have uh, the journalistic right. edge, uh, but no you can monetary. Do the breaking thing. breaking here. You know, ephesiology <laughs> broke the news. Yeah. Right now, the news sure. story just says Matt Till has something going on. That's that's our scoop. <laughs> I, that should I be guess. enough to to pique people's interest. We'll uh, Dave, that's we'll your see. next shirt. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so last week or the last episode that we aired here on the Ephesiology Podcast was a conversation that occurred between Matt and Dave. Now, the beauty is uh, we aired that. What a wonderful conversation! Uh, really was encouraged by it as well as challenged by it. That conversation that we aired, though. Uh, was actually recorded in about 2019 that we were, we were trying to figure out when that was recorded. Uh, so this was not something that Matt and Dave talked about just the other week. We were encouraged and we decided, hey, let's just uh, re-air that. Um, it was a wonderful conversation. It was just a lot longer ago. So I wanted, uh, Matt, if you wouldn't mind, um, how, how did it feel listening to yourself from over four years ago? Um, how, how was that process of listening to the slightly younger version of Matt then and what he said and felt, and then the process, uh, where you are today, April 29th, 2019 is when it, uh, was aired. We probably, I think we recorded that maybe the week before that, uh, Dave, if you remember right there from your living room, um, at your kitchen table, I think pretty much if I'm not mistaken, probably where you're sitting right now, exactly where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I remember that moment so well, and um and uh, it, for for many reasons, uh, because there was a journey that was going on. We were in the middle of our church plant, our church plant experiment. Dave um uh, and his wife were just were were just really faithful members of uh, of, of the church. Uh, it was going through a season of of change and trial, and we were just we were trying to figure out different modes. Um, in which uh, we thought maybe uh, would work the best. Originally, we were kind of pursuing a, kind of more of a traditional legacy launch um, in the suburban uh, area of Chicago. And uh, we ended up uh, moving into more of a house church um, model uh, approach uh, during that time and in that season. Uh, I was doing a lot more of these podcasting, um, it, you know, trying to do some innovative work there. Um, so yeah, we were just trying a lot of different ways of how do we get our message out and how do we articulate who we are and yet still encourage the members who are there. Um, and I, I loved what you were doing, Matt. I, th I still think it's a beautiful model. Um, I love the idea of the pre-recorded messages and the engagement in a smaller community to, about those things. I just, I, I mean, I still really loved thinking <laughs> about what you were doing and, and watching what you were doing. Well, thanks for that. And, and you know, looking back on it, it felt like it was a really kind of like a, almost like a, a mini seminary kind of classroom of itself. I, I, we really dug into deep topics. Uh, you know, the the podcast was modeled as kind of like a lecture uh, in a hybrid mode. I mean, really, if you were to attend a, a college or, or a seminary today and you're a part of a hybrid classroom, this is what you would get is 
you would get a maybe a recorded uh you know lecture from your professor and um and then you might show up to classroom or you'd go into a networking uh you know kind of collaborative or something and then have those com those deeper conversations um and so that was kind of the model uh that we were somewhat pursuing maybe a bit imperfectly at the time but we were trying it out um and you know but also too and i, I look back now and and i'm i'm not afraid to have this conversation and be more honest with myself and with others but I personally was going through a, a pretty like deep deconstruction s moment in journey. Um, Dave saw it on my face, I think pretty, pretty early on. And, and he was uh, really supportive and encouraging uh, through that process. And I was starting to look at a lot of, um, you know, a lot of different pieces of our tradition, um, especially the conservative evangelical, more fundamentalist leaning tradition. And was starting to unravel a lot of those, a lot of the main topics and issues of the time. And so for me, um, you know, I was starting to really kind of look at um, some of these particular, you know, as we were going through the journey, we were doing it on ephesiology, having great, you know, dialogue and conversation. Um, but even then too, just even as a church leader, you know, asking these questions and wanting to do it faithfully and trying to do it to the best of my ability without um, hurting <laughs> <laughs> other people and with and and while still wrestling through it myself and just trying to be vulnerable in it but also at the same time be the leader where people are looking up to you and asking me you know seeking me answers dave was somebody that i could go back to who i know who had wrestled through these issues before um dave has been interacting on this particular issue of headship and authority and women in ministry for far longer than i have uh almost even really been a a, a, a christian um so I, I know that he was somebody that, who was safe who i could go to and ask these questions privately with we were dialoguing about it um i was doing my other reading as well on my own and um he was just wonderful enough to sit down and, and have like this hour hour and 50 you know i forget how long it was but i know it was over an hour long conversation that we published and recorded um and there was so much more we could have we could have talked about um but looking back i i just i just go wow what a what a pivotal moment it was for me to be able to have that conversation with dave and the dialogue that came even afterwards within the church context was actually Dave, I don't know if you remember much of it, but I felt like it was quite productive. Um, it left some people like affirmed. It left some people, I think, kind of questioning and wondering, wow, this is really insightful. I didn't think of it that way. Um, even, you know, I think when people's presuppositions are 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 challenged in a way, I think sometimes they kind of come away a little wrestling. But I I recall it was I feel like it was was productive. Dave, what were some of the things that you remember? um after or during the conversation but more more the response after because you all were so bold to have that conversation and uh put it out there well i think um exactly what matt said that's what occurred and i remember one of the people most uh who seemed to be most um it kind of turned on by these ideas or enlightened by the conversation was his own mom she was like, I had never thought of those things. And she began to uh, have those types of conversations with Matt. And I don't know where that ended up, Matt, or if it's even appropriate to bring it up. But um, yeah, there were people who were shocked that there was another way to look at it and that we were not questioning the authority of Scripture. We were not trying to say Paul didn't write something. We were dealing face on with what was written and questioning whether or not it really had to mean what the traditionalists have said it has to mean. For, for all three of you, um, how have you found, how have you found this conversation going in the spheres that you are a part of um, addressing not just headship which again that that was the you know banner title thing being talked about but that is very much connected to uh women's roles in ministry women's roles uh in church period women's roles in the home how have you all seen this addressed in the last 10 15 years what's the what's the what's the temperature of that oh. conversation if you don't mind, I'd like to jump in on that one. Um, Please. Since that conversation took place, um, we watched 
mega churches come unraveled because of male leadership that abused their positions. Sometimes there were theological issues, uh, sometimes, but most often the scandals were sexual and or power, abuses of power. And it made it very difficult for many evangelicals, I think most uh, people who don't go to church these days were affected by those types of scandals. And my wife has been one of them. She uh, was extremely disappointed when the scandal happened at Willow Creek. And so we, as a family, she and I, have been searching for churches with female pastors. And we are currently attending uh, a rather famous Mennonite church called Reba Place. Both pastors are women, and they are uh, stunning in terms of their presentation of scripture, their teachings. Uh, they've had other members of their church speak. Uh, one is a professor from Garrett. She gave an amazing presentation teaching scripture, and um, my wife feels safer in that kind of a church. And she's energized as a woman. She feels like here are women doing the leadership, not just kind of being given a courtesy to speak occasionally, but they are the leaders. They are running things. And there's a, a second church, uh, more of a kind of a house church. It meets in a public space, but it's uh, it's also men. And I and we we frequent there from time to time. It's also led by a woman. And um, when I look back on the controversy over women in leadership, so called headship question, and so on, to me it's a distant problem. I don't see. I don't struggle with it. It's not even something I'm fresh on. You know, you're going to ask me some of these. You know, if you ask me some, some to defend certain positions, it's been a while. I haven't been arguing that way because I'm relaxed and comfortable in the space where women are leading appropriately and effectively and they're feeding our souls. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it is kind of funny when you have that opportunity, when you walk into a conversation and somebody asks, what is your opinion about this? meaty thing that we've been arguing with for two hours he said are you are you arguing about that <laughs> what i have huh never even occurred to me or I haven't even thought why we should be arguing about that but i can see that means a lot to you um matt michael how, how yeah. about you what's the temperature in your in your spheres i i would like to just tag on that with dave because i i feel like my contribution to that is much of the same i think when you finally kind of unravel yourself from sometimes the the position and kind of give yourself the space um suddenly you're a lot more freer over i don't feel like i have to justify a particular position on this that is can only be seen one direction in one way and it suddenly becomes a distant reality of why is this even an issue um it's not for me it may be for you but it's certainly not for me um another way to answer the question andrew you asked is how do you see this conversation being discussed and talked about over the last you know 10 15 years or whatever well i may not have been directly engaged in this conversation that that long maybe 10 years at the most is when i really became more aware of it um I would actually like to suggest I'd like to talk I, I've been my I'm more I'm more shocked in the ways that it's not being talked about. Mm. I'm more surprised wow. as to wow. it was not too long ago in American history and in the West that scripture was being used to justify racial segregation. It was not too distant in the in the past in which scripture is being used to justify slavery. Right. Uh, the, the, those who still choose to use scripture to justify those, those things are in the minority greatly of right. And so, yes. yes, they're in the minority, but the hermeneutic behind slavery and segregation is the same hermeneutic behind discrimination against women. It's the same theology. 
And that, unfortunately, is a majority in the evangelical community. Mm-hmm. And and that and that's where I agree with you, Dave. And I think to me, like for those who want to have a righteous indignation to suggest we need to change this, I think it has every right and should be empowered to do that within their churches. Um, for me, though, it's not an issue anymore. <laughs> it's like, because because I put on the same platform, racial segregation, um, segregation of any sort is wrong. And I don't see evidence for it nor support for it uh, in the scriptures as being a way of life for a thriving future for today in which the vision of of Christ had for his people and for his world. Mm-hmm. I put the same for the same as racism, um, I, you know, in slavery, as well as uh, women as being second then to men. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Uh, for me, I've moved on and that that's, that's me. Like, and I think that's the journey. Whereas in 2019, when we're having this conversation, um, I'm pretty firm in the position as to where I was at the moment, because I had, I felt like I had enough convincing evidence for me and great discussions with people like Dave, but you could still hear my own like wrestling mm-hmm. of like, am I sure? You know what <laughs> but I mean? what if, but you know what, what I mean? if they say this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but when you kind of give yourself the room and the space and kind of back out of it and realize the bigger picture here and and its places and connection. And Dave, you're right, is that the hermeneutic is still much of this. It's still baked within it. I I go, I, I, at some point we have to make a decision. At some point you have to allow yourself to see the bigger picture, I suppose, and go, what really matters here? And what was the real heartbeat to, I think the message and the victory that we have um, in which the message and the gospel message uh, is is trying to portray and, and show us. Mm. Um, and so for me, I, I'm like, Dave, I'm like, I'm not as fresh up on the arguments anymore, but partly because I don't need to be. I felt like I was, anytime I need to be up on the arguments is because I was in the system that felt like it needed to continuously mm. defend and uphold um, the authority of men over women. And um and not only so. that, uh, coming alongside being within a system that is constantly asking, are you orthodox enough? Are you orthodox enough? Are you orthodox mm-hmm. enough? And bringing in measuring sticks that just, I don't want to say keep changing, uh, but they be different measuring sticks are brought in at different times to say, this is now the new argument. And can you hold up or are you out? Michael, mm-hmm. you got really excited. You stepped away. Oh. You grabbed a book. I did. Yeah. I, I don't know if it, it's fair to say that this is the book that launched it all. Uh, the not. book being shown on screen for those who don't have a camera is Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, an A response to evangelical feminism by Dr. John Piper and Dr. Wayne Grudem. Yeah, they, they edited the volume and um, gosh, I'm getting goosebumps because I, I mean, I remember receiving this. It was uh, a wedding present to Lori and me. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, and, you know, in some ways, uh, the, the subtitle here. Was that in the 19, response, uh, was that, was that in like 1800s or something? 18. <laughs> Michael. We did celebrate 30 years of marriage the other day, uh, but I'm hey, sorry, I was way off. That yeah. should be, I, didn't, I didn't, I did not, I did not mean to demone Lori at all, you know, demean Lori in this. I, cause she's yes. young as an, you know, she's just, it, it's she's, you. I was kind of more looking at. <laughs> yeah. But it's a response to evangelical feminism. And, and this, I mean, this is, I think, uh, characteristic of how we tend to engage in evangelicalism uh, with cultural issues. We react. And in many ways, this, this volume is a reaction to something for right or wrong, good or bad. Uh, it's a reaction to evangelical feminism. And it's almost as if, you know, in the in the 80s, um, well, probably 70s, 80s, as evangelicalism, uh, evangelical feminism was uh, rising, um, uh, it was a pendulum swing. We went from one extreme to another. And uh, and I think what I mean, of course, one of the things that we value at Ephesiology is that we're always looking for a consensus view of these things, not polemical. I mean, we've been there. We're doing that continually. Uh, We're involved in these polemical conversations that just are so divisive in the church that somehow if we can bring our voices together with each other and really wrestle with these things at deeper levels, 
um, then we might be able to achieve some sort of consensus. But, you know, what's striking, I, and maybe this is bringing up some old memories that I don't want to bring up, but what's striking <laughs> here is going through the table of contents and seeing the number of scholars that were writing in this volume and where they're from, uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, Bethel uh, Theological Seminary, uh, Knox Theological Seminary, Matt. Uh, I, I mean, these are these are significant people. Westminster Theological Seminary, significant scholars who contributed to this volume, and and there, I mean, there's some use to, to it um, uh, in, in terms of understanding what the mindset was back in the 80s and 90s to move toward this. Um, well, this idea that the title is bringing out, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, so, yeah, it's been a long r road. I get, suppose I'm still involved in it just simply because of the academic nature of the conversation. Uh, we have a couple of our grad students that are working still on this issue. Um, and so it's in many ways, culturally, in the United States, particularly, it, it hasn't been settled. It's still not, very, not even close, unfortunately. Yeah. And we're seeing it. It, it plays out um, almost almost on a monthly basis in something happening in the church, uh, whether, you know, it's Saddleback or, you know, what the SBC recently did uh in terms of disfellowshipping churches that are ordaining uh, women pastors and, and so on. So, I mean, it's still very much a part of what is happening in the evangelical world, uh, at least in the American evangelical world, I should qualify. And David, I appreciated so much what your comment uh, about the hermeneutics behind it, because that's still very much something that we have to wrestle with. Is how are we arriving at th th these conclusions, um, and, and and what's driving it? So, my my, my two cents at this point. I, you yeah. know, it, go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say, Christians for Biblical Equality came out with a book almost as thick, refuting that book. Mm -hmm. So you go back and forth, and there's so much minutia in it, and. The reality is people are arguing for the position they want the conclusion to be. Yep. And if you step back and look at it and just think, what's the common sense here? The, the so-called complementarians want to prevent women from preaching. They are opposing the preaching of the gospel when they do that. How do you oppose the preaching of a woman without opposing the preaching of the gospel and therefore not be opposing the gospel itself. Mm -hmm. It's just common sense. If you're trying to stop the word of God from spreading, for whatever your rationalizations are, um, you've got a major contradiction going in your worldview. Yeah, yeah. And, and Michael, even just to talk to you, like, and, and you brought up Knox, and I just want to make sure clear to you for the audience that I don't speak on behalf of Knox on this particular podcast. But, you know, another example, though, as to where um, this, this conversation does come up is in a position such as seminaries like a Knox Theological Seminary that honestly, it takes a neutral stance, or at least, and it yeah. says, we do not support one we do not support one place on this or another right but rather yeah. they've taken the position of saying mainly because we're a seminary we just teach we're going to teach from the scriptures we're going to teach theology we're going to show you the different presentations but you're going to go back to your home church your denomination and they are the ordaining body they're the ones that right. choose whether a woman can preach or not as to where you know where the stands now i understand some that's will awfully say that, nice that's, to say that yeah it, you it know is. what I don't want to but, lose but your it, train of thought, Matt, yeah. but yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I think, you, and you rightly bring up th this idea of academic freedom. It, you know, scholars have academic freedom in the context of their academies to write about the things that they're passionate about, the things that they believe in, and defend those. 
And so just because a professor is from a particular institution doesn't mean that the institution aligns with the professor in all that they would espouse. So, right. Yeah. To know, to know, and to prove your point, uh, at least Dave, if I heard you right, the lead article writer uh, is going to be Dr. Wayne Grudem, who at the time was at TEDS. And one of the people on the quote unquote opposing side was Dr. Cancer, who it was at TEDS. So you can't say an institution says these things, and this is where the institution lies. They have great freedom, and even the people who are a part of those institutions might be the lead torchbearers against the idea from the other side. So, um, exactly. yeah, we can't we were, can't throw anybody under the bus like that. There were many professors, published authors, for, who taught at TEDS who were egalitarian and supported that view. Um, the ir irony for me is that Grudem proposes a view of the Trinity that is less than orthodox, as I understand orthodoxy and the Trinity. So what he was doing at Trinity, teaching a uh, eternal subordination of Christ, mm -hmm. seemed to me like it sh the institution should have found that revolt revolting. Yeah, and I think later, uh, uh, at least if I recall, he he denounced that particular view and has kind of revised his what some were looking at as a neo subordinist view of Christ. Uh, I'm not that, sure that, he achieved that as well as he would like, like us to think. Yeah, but uh, but talking about our hermeneutics and the conclusions, the logical conclusions that our hermeneutic will lead us. That if you get to the point where a woman is to submit to a man, just like Christ is to submit to God, then you are going to get into some form of Arianism, uh, that j just logically. And, um, and of course, that's, that, I mean, we can't hold that and uh, claim to understand or believe in the Trinity. Well, right. And the, the subordination or submission, rather, within the Trinity uh, could be argued to be mutual between the Father and the Son. Um, Christ says, everything that's yours is mine. You've given me all things. You've given me all authority, and they are co-regents together uh, in their rule. So the other, the other part of that is Christ's submission is voluntary. It's not mandated by his nature as to who he is. Uh, he submits to the Father out of love, and the Father gives to him out of love. Um, but the complementarian view is women have to submit because they're women. It, it's an accident of birth that causes them to have to be subservient, mm -hmm. whereas the scriptures see both the man and the woman as in mutual love and respect and service to one another. And Dave, I appreciate something you brought out in the podcast, specifically in regards to that, for when the complementarian position came out for people who were assigned now the opposite side of the egalitarian position. It was like, but we we called ourselves complementarians. Like, like the idea of what, we're complementing each other, it was their argument. And then to say uh, it got sw swooped up and it got flipped. And now uh, the women who were in the role of uh, submitting was, was a superior, inferior sort of scenario, uh, which the people who said men and women compliment each other were saying, that's, wait, that's not, no, nope, that wasn't what we were saying. And uh, then the term got stolen and, and swiped and you know, changed all over again. Typical gaslighting is what it is, um, because complementarity is between two equal parts, uh, and the so-called complementarians, who are really promoting a patriarchy or gender hierarchy, are saying, I lead, you follow, that's complementarity. Well, that's hierarchy. It's not well, part of yeah, and, and look and look too. Like I mean, sociologically, we know that the that the party, the person, the group that is in position of privilege, Mike does not right. want <laughs> does not want and fears the loss of their position. 
And mm-hmm. and Dave, this is the conversation that you and I had a lot. This is baked into everything in which we were we were talking about is the message of Christ is the man who has all privilege in the universe humbly submits himself on the cross. Yeah. So like I, I there is not a greater message out there I think than than that one today that the greatest love is to lay down your life for your friend, for your wife, for your, for your spouse, for your um your your partner, your your friend, um uh, your neighbor, anyone in the world. And and so for me like I this this issue like when the church wants to bring this up and we see conservative politics get involved at this and and say you know, feminism is the reason why XXX that we're going to war in Israel. I, I haven't seen that. I don't have no claim to that, but I'm sure somebody's making that case somewhere <laughs> on social media. Um, I, I, I reject it on the value, on the face of the fact that it doesn't square with the true values as to what makes humanity and is po- and empowers humanity to come together. We, we need a like the message that I want to be more about is one of compassion. Like, are we people that are filled with compassion to the point that we see other people, that we see our neighbor, that we seek to understand them, we seek to care for them? Um, and are we include, do we have empathy and neighborly love for them? Um, then from compassion, are we curious people? It, humanity has always been about curiosity. What makes this work? How does fire begin? <laughs> where, where, where did we come from? Uh, you know, and and getting to know other people and other cultures and 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 their their life and lived experiences. Are we people of compassion and curiosity? And then, what makes humanity even greater is our ability to create, and we create as co-creators with God. The greatest creator has now enabled us in His image to also to create. And those are the messages. That's the embedded the, the the embedded message that, like to me, like why are we arguing? Why are churches up in arms over this? Why is this even a discussion anymore? If we if we could get down to the core message and the core values that we proclaim as being from the holy text of God and, and God breathe, let us move on from the the lesser things, right? Um, and let us move on to the greater things, especially in a world of great turmoil. And when war is breaking out and and the world is in fear again, the last thing we need to be talking about and dividing over is whether we should be allowing a woman to preach and the position of whether mm-hmm. women should be going out into the workplace or not. And if men, you need to like figure it out and 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 stay home for a little bit or something, you know, like the, the, you're not losing your manhood. <laughs> you're not, you're not at risk, but when you're in the position it, it of, go on. No, uh, no, I was just getting excited. Uh, it's so nice to have your voice back on the Ephesiology podcast, Matt, and your passion uh, the, about uh, this topic. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I appreciate that very much because I think you're absolutely right. Where's our compassion uh, in in these issues? And uh, you know, it's I just can't imagine having to stand before the Lord and hearing Him ask, "Why were you dividing?" over this issue right. uh, why couldn't you unite around me and the mission yeah. that i've given you and uh i i mean we're we're not going to be immune yeah. to uh asking or answering those questions well on the topic of ephesus right the ephesians uh we talked in the podcast about how the dividing walls in the temple <laughs> were uh, set up to keep Gentiles in one place and women in another place and so on. Those dividing walls have been brought down. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, what does Christ do with his bride? He elevates her to the heavenlies and seats her with him in the heavenlies. Where does he sit? Over all rule and authority, right? So people, when they look at the Ephesians um, letter, for guidance on Kefwe or Kefale, they often focus on that fifth chapter. But look at chapter one and two and what it has to say about these distinctions and Christ's example. His example in chapter five is that he washes and cleanses and purifies his bride. In chapter two, he elevates her to sit with him in the heavenlies where Mm. we know to be above all rule and authority. There's a, there's a partnership he seeks with his people, 
mm. with his bride, with his church. We become co-heirs with him, meaning we inherit the same stuff. So we are, uh, when we split hairs about gender or race, we are slipping back into a fallen mentality about these things. The result of the fall was that the man would seek to lord over the woman and the woman would seek to have him. However, that's interpreted. It's the same phrasing where sin is crouching at the door, trying to have Cain. Uh, there was a rivalry set up in the fallen world and Christ has redeemed us from the curse that curse in that passage in Genesis that we're talking about. So we have a new creation and a new model, and Christ becomes the example for the master and the slave, mm -hmm. the and the wife, the mm -hmm. parents and the kids. They're all to follow his example. And when we do that, we are um, trying to outserve one another, is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's how, you know, in my, my marriage, my wife and I, uh, we're always trying to outserve one another. And it makes for a very happy marriage, very mm -hmm. happy life. I, I think she wins most of the time, but that's because she's very competitive. Yes. Well, so I actually, Dave, when you say that, uh, my friend, uh, John Kinnison, uh, gave me this analogy, and I use it often at weddings. Uh, he says, he says, you know, when you were kids and you guys were trying to, as captains, pick who was going to pick first and you had the baseball bat and then, you know, you grab, you grab the baseball bat and then the next person puts their hand above and you're trying to see who is the person who last gets to put their hand on top of the, the butt of the baseball bat to say, okay, I am now the last here. So I get to pick first. Uh, he said, he said, okay, marriage is just like that, except it's the exact opposite. Instead of trying to one up each other or say, I am first, you are constantly seeking, I will serve you. No, 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 no. I will serve you. Uh uh. I will outserve you. Where you're constantly trying to go and lift the other up to serve, to, to put them in the best light, to support, to encourage, uh, to do exactly what Christ has done to us, clearly laid out in Ephesians um, and throughout <laughs> scripture. This is, this is what we are called to do. And so, why would we? Why would we change that? Yeah. Why would we change that? And, and, and I'm glad it's old ways. I'm glad it's the opposite because when I was a kid, getting choosing up teams on the ball field, and the captains would choose who, who they wanted on their team, I was always the last one picked, and then they would trade me. So, uh, hmm. and that's not that's not a joke. That actually would happen. If we have to have Lee, we get this other guy, and um, so. <laughs> It's nice that it's up there because the last shall be first in the kingdom of God. Right? The least <laughs> shall be as the greatest. The, the, those are the lessons we're always teaching our kids as well, too. Trying to remind them about that when they're arguing about who gets the first of whatever <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Dave, you brought something up. I've, I've been wrestling whether uh, or not to share this just because it might take us a bit far afield. And, and I don't mean to take us too far, but... um. So uh, we were just, my wife, my family, actually, uh, we were just in Athens, Greece, and we took one day and went down to Corinth. And our tour guide was, was a brother in Christ. And so we sat there and we talked all about the specific context of Corinth at the time of the writing of First Corinthians. And so we're, we're looking at uh, the center of trade that Corinth had become. We were talking all about how far and wide people were coming uh, to do business there in Corinth, why it was about to become one of the biggest cities in that area, uh, center of trade and whatnot. And because it was that case, prostitution was on the rise. Temple prostitutes were on the rise because people were coming there and serving those gods and doing their rituals. And, uh, as Michael, I know you talked about in uh, your book, Ephesiology, and you can read elsewhere that uh, those who were temple prostitutes would have shaved heads. And that was part of their place that you're looking at me confused, Michael. I think that was in your book. I know we've talked about this, but um, we've had well, this the Scholars are so divided, long. actually, on the issue of temple prostitution in Corinth. 
Um, hmm. So I, yeah, I, I, anyway, go ahead. The, Not to detract from what you were saying. Okay. I think the point's going to be relevant. The point is that those who were coming to faith who were in that lifestyle did not have hair. So when they came into the church, no matter um, how hard they tried, they stood out. And uh, they were the ones who this is you and this was your life because look at you, you have a shaved head Um, or your hair is short because it used to be shaved. And so those women would come in with their heads covered. And so when Paul says about the head covering, that was actually a call and a a contextual encouragement to say, ladies, y'all, everybody cover their heads because we don't want this to be those people had their head covering heads covered. Why? Because clearly those were the temple prostitutes. Those were the ones that had this lifestyle. Paul is encouraging them. Ladies have your heads covered so that we are serving one another. We are serving. We are looking at each other as equals uh, on common ground in Christ, because in Christ, we are all righteous in Christ. We are all one. He is our head and we are all part of his body. And so there are no stratifications. This person had this past life and they need to be looked down on or treated differently. Please, with your heads, have them covered so that when we show up and gather as the body, we are able to love and serve one another. And so some a passage from my wife, she, she was almost in tears and she actually was a little on the angry and feisty side. Um, because looking back at how she was raised in a highly Baptistic culture that told women, make sure you always grow your hair long, make sure you don't cut your hair because you're, this is your glory and your head should always be covered. And to have something that there was a cultural thing that she was brought up in and told, this is what you must do because this is what honors God. And then to to hear from somebody in that context and from their research, Michael, certainly don't disagree on the uh, scholarly uh, quibbling um, for her to be able to hear like, hey, this big thing that you were told was a mark of how holy you were. Uh, it was just bad. It's bad biblical interpretation. And uh, uh, they missed they missed the forest for the trees. It, it was about loving and serving one another and continuing to keep Christ as the head. Yeah. And I just, I find it so funny. We get to this place in our world where again, we're having the wrong fights and we have missed keeping Christ as the head and loving and serving and honoring one another who are his bride. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that's the point. I mean, the squ- the scholarly squibbling about prostitution in Corinth uh, and the meaning of saved heads. Uh, well, well, I think there's been... I wouldn't say new light on this, but certainly uh, uh, more understanding that the the shaved head re- reference was more in reference to adulterous relationships that were occurring in Corinth, and the woman mm. with the shaved mm. head that was a a retribution for mm. her adulterous actions. As far as the prostitution, maybe at the Acro Corinth, you know that big hill that's. Uh, uh, I can't remember which direction it is, East, uh, west, west of the city where yes. there's another temple. Might might have been something there if there were temple prostitution at the time, but uh, many will suggest that th- this was a misunderstanding that Strabo have when he wrote his uh, geography of the area. But whatever the case, the point is that um, there is – uh, the call for uh, love for each other. Uh, and yeah, so. Well, I think the other thing that people miss when they get into that section of Corinthians where Paul's talking about the head covering and who's the head of who and so on is the outcome of his argument is to empower the women to prophesy in the church. Mm. That it doesn't matter who came from whom. It matters that we're in the Lord. And these women who can prophesy now, they, they are given these veils as authorization. Um, they use the passage to subjugate women and to treat the veil as a sign of, of subordination 
when in fact, Paul is looking for a way to free the women who have the gift of prophecy and who want to be able to pray in church, and he's giving them authorization through that passage. So if, you're, mm-hmm. if your conclusions come to the contrary, mm-hmm. you're, you're stuck with a problem with where Paul ended up at the end. Yeah, yeah. Good. That, that's a great point, David. You know what? I'm sitting here staring at four white men. And what? I don't want us to miss that point. <laughs> and it would be wonderful to have some uh, female voices on this issue. And and so, Andrew, maybe that's uh, on us to hmm. uh, see if we can uh, invite some female guests on the uh, onto the podcast to talk about this. Because, yeah, I, I mean, this is important, important, and we want to give voice in some way. To those who have, in one way or another, been voiceless. And they have voices. It's more that others have gone out of their way to squash it. Squash it. Uh, Matt, do you have any closing thoughts for us? You want to come yeah, off the this... top rope with anything? <laughs> this, is, uh, this has been fun, guys. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. And uh, to Dave, as you can hear, as the audience can hear, I mean, Dave has just been Dave. Thank you. Just, I just want to say to you, thank you for your um, your continued uh, friendship um, and uh, your wisdom. Just speaking into my life uh, on this issue, and as well as many others, and uh, standing with our family and just being such an encouragement and an inspiration as well too. Um, as just a, a man uh, of God and also um, a man who who faithfully seeks to serve his family well. Um, so thank you, uh, Andrew and Dave. It's oh, Matt, I'm sorry, Andrew and Michael. It's always fun uh, to do this, and I'm thankful for you guys. Um, you know, my my last my last thought on this is just um, that you know, to Michael's point, um, is yes, I would affirm. You know, um, let's get some ladies on uh, and some women who are who could speak on this issue as well. It would be great for the audience to hear from them. Um, I've been also deeply influenced by women on this issue. Um, but I think it's good too for your audience to hear uh, some white men talk about this in a in a humble way and in a way that makes sense in the wrestling that we've had because I think people do um, need to hear from sometimes their own who have gone through the struggle or are wrestling through um, these issues. And if you're a pastor, uh, if you're a ministry leader, somebody who is um, thinking through this issue has been wrestling through it, has been you know maybe a closet egalitarian and. And wondering how your church is going to receive you. Um, if my experience is of any encouragement to you, it is um, be bold, be brave, be confident, be you, um, and, uh, and and serve the church in the way that you know best how. Uh, and, and they're looking for true leadership in these times and in these days. And if you recognize that the leadership you're giving them is is not uh, in accordance to your values, and it's not in accordance to what you see Scripture uh, is teaching, uh, let alone uh, just even the 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 fund the fund the foundational message of the gospel, then do what is right today. Do not wait. Do what is right today. Um, and uh, I would just encourage you to to do that um, and and to stand up for that. Well, dang, Matt. What a what a close. It's like you used to close the podcast. You know, you just you just had this great final thought and I we aren't topping that. So, thank you very much. Uh Dave, I will echo everything Matt yeah. said. We were so thankful to have your weighted words so wisely um given to us on the podcast. Uh Matt, thank you for uh I guess having some decent ideas too. Uh <laughs> It, it really was. It really has been an honor to have you both on. I think Mac, Michael and I both, um, this this conversation would not have been possible without y'all. Uh, yeah. So really, really appreciate what you brought to it. Well, for uh, Michael and myself, we have been thankful to have you as our listener joining us on the Ecclesiology Podcast. If you desire to learn more about that idea that Matt and Michael both put out there with the Physiology Masterclasses, uh, just go online to masterclasses.ephesiology.com and uh, get more information. If you do want to continue education, there is also there are free resources. Um, this is not just pay only. Uh, we really do want to continue to equip the church, and we are excited to help you. So go and investigate that. If you would like to join more with this conversation, uh, we are present on Facebook, so go to Ephesiology Podcast there. 
And I guess you could email Michael, right? Email Michael and I. Just just, just get out all those frustrations. So send the frustrated emails uh, to Michael at ephesiology.com and send the excited ones to me, Andrew Johnson at yourtownchurch.org. Uh, but for Dave, for Matt, for Michael, and myself, thank you for joining us on the Ephesiology Podcast. <laughs>